Welcome everyone. So Tim Gerlach and I, we are from the research center in Jülich in the really west of Germany. And we work on multi-step biocatalysis. That means we identify and optimize new enzymes, but we strongly also look at reaction conditions and complete process designs, especially with focus on sustainability. So what, um, what Tim is now showing you is our latest attempt because with the plenty of enzymes you can combine nowadays, you can get a huge set of products. But with you, all these new, new opportunities, also new challenges arise. And this is, for example, cross-reactivity, because sometimes the enzymes do also react with compounds they shouldn't react with. And so what you can do is you can separate the steps in space. This is what we frequently do. But now we also want to separate them in time to enable um, the synthesis in a batch system with type separation. And one approach we follow over here, a really recent approach, is um, currently performed by Tim Gerlach. So Tim studied um, biotechnology and got a bachelor degree at the University of Bielefeld. And then he moved to the University of Aachen, where he did his master um, degree in biotechnology. And he's now in my group and is a third year PhD student. And we'll show you now what we did on enabling this one pot regulation. The floor is yours, Tim. Yes, thank you, Dörte, for the nice introduction. And uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation. So um, as Dörte already mentioned, in biocatalysis, we have the great opportunity to produce complex products um, via the combination of different enzymatic steps. But with these combinations, also challenges arise, which is, for example, the case for for the here presented cascade, um, where we start from 3-hydroxybenzaldehyde um, involving a carboligation, uh, amination, and a cyclization, yielding tetrahydroesequinoline. Um, tetrahydroesequinoline is a bioactive compound which has three chiral centers and a tertiary amine. Um, but during the enzymatic production um, with this cascade, a cross reactivity can occur, which is comparable to uh, substrate promiscuity. This means, for example, the transaminase can also convert the uh, starting substrate to a very dominant uh, side product. But further, the transaminase can also convert the aldehyde, which is added for the um, cyclization step, st uh, step for, uh, to a second side product. And finally, the carboligase um, can also act on the aldehyde aglet for the cyclization and form a third side product. So with these many side products produced, um, a one pot um, production of the tetrahydrosinucleic line is quite unfeasible and the reaction steps have to be separated in time or in space. This could be done, for example, by a sequential approach where the enzymes are added uh, to the reaction um, solution for the respective cascade step but afterwards they have to be removed again to avoid cross-reactivity, and this is quite elaborate. So with these issues, we are dealing, uh, dealing in the project LightCast, where we want to regulate synthetic enzyme cascades via light. So we choose light as a stimulus for biocatalysis because it is cheap, it is simply available in the form of LEDs, and it's also very easy to uh, regulate uh, as you can just switch it on and off. So in the project LightCast, we address cross-reactivity, especially in one pot reaction systems. And in this project, um, we are trying to focus on the separation of reaction steps in time. But in our group, we have, of course, also projects dealing with the separation of reaction steps in space. So what exactly am I doing? Um, I'm dealing with a light-induced enzyme inactivation. Therefore, I couple uh, enzymes with so-called genetically encoded photosynthesizers, yielding in fusion enzymes, which are also genetically encoded and photosensitive. Um, the specialty here is that upon illumination of the photosynthesizer tag, the photosynthesizer is able to produce reactive oxygen species, which then inactivate my enzyme. So is this really the goal of my project? Yes, it is. So we're really inactivating the enzymes. Um, so this project is um, in the area of fundamental research and we want to really test 
what is actually possible with photosynthesizers and biocatalysis, as this kind of regulation is uh, quite new in biocatalysis. So at the moment, we uh, focus on the inactivation of enzymes, but future targets could also be um, applying the setup for whole cell biocatalysis or uh, in microscale chips, for example. So let's come back to the cascade. Um, how could a like regulated cascade uh, in my case look like? So remember only the carboligase and the transaminase are involved in cross reactions. Therefore, only these have to be tagged with photosynthesizers and inactivated. So when we perform the cascade, we add the substrate and the carboligase. Then the first intermediate is formed. After the reaction is completed, the carboligase can be inactivated. Then the second enzyme is added the next intermediate is formed. After this step, also the transaminase is added. And finally, we add the cyclase and our product is formed and cross-reactivity has been avoided. So what are these genetically encoded photosynthesizers actually? Um, they are proteins which contain a chromophore and they belong either to the group of the flavin binding fluorescent proteins or to the GFP-based proteins. And they are light sensitive compounds, which mean upon illumination with light, they can produce reactive oxygen species, um, which are mainly singlet oxygen or hydrogen peroxide. So these two types of ROS um, have different abilities, for example, in terms of diffusion distance. So singlet oxygen is highly reactive and can only uh, diffuse over distances of about 150 nanometers. Uh, hydrogen peroxide is compared to singlet oxygen a little bit less reactive and can cover distances comparable to the length of one cell. And currently genetically encoded photosynthesizers are mostly uh, applied in the medical context, for example, in the topic of um, uh, photodynamic therapy. So in my project, um, I at first started with the production of different um, photosynthesizer fusion enzymes and tested their activity in the dark. The next step was to test um, if the fusion enzymes can actually be inactivated and if the fusion tag is working. And then the next step was the optimization of the inactivation. And finally, we want to be able to um, set up our sequential cascade, um, which is regulated by light. So we tested a variety of different photosynthesizers in uh, this project, but I will only focus on this presentation on the um, flavin binding photosynthesizers, um, which are at first SOPP, um, which is a monomer and produces um, higher amounts of single oxygen. Then we have ECFBFP, which produces um, higher amounts of hydrogen peroxide and is a dimer as well as PP2FBFP. And PP2FBFP is more of a weaker photosynthesizer and produces uh, both kinds of reactive oxygen species. Finally, we have SOPP3, which is one of the strongest photosynthesizers known up to now and produces high amounts of single oxygen and hydrogen peroxide and is again a monomer. So these photosynthesizers um, we got from our cooperation partner, uh, Thomas Drepper. And the next step was to fuse all of these photosynthesizers um, to the carboligase. Um, in our case, this was a variant of the pyruvate decarboxylase from Acidobacter pasturianus. And with these carboligase photosynthesizer fusions, which are four of kind, um, we tested the activity and the inactivation to evaluate which photosynthesizer is um, suited best for our purposes. So uh, on the left in black, you can see the activity of the untagged um, carboligase. And with the first fusion with SOPP, we can see that the activity um, is quite lower, but this can be, attacked, uh, can be expected when fusing a tag uh, to an enzyme. The second fusion with SOPP3 shows much higher of a residual activity, and this is on a comparable level to the uh, unfused enzyme, uh, which was quite nice to achieve. For the two other uh, photosynthesizer fusion enzymes with ECFBFP and PP2FBFP, the activity was very, very low. So remember I told you earlier that ECFBFP and PP2FBFP are naturally dimeric photosynthesizers. And it appears that the dimeric character of the photosynthesizers lead to an aggregation of the fusion enzymes. So when you think of a single photosynthesizer fusion enzyme, um, they can aggregate and form some kind of three-dimensional three -dimensional insoluble protein aggregates, which means um, in terms of activity, we're not looking at single soluble enzymes, 
but at aggregate forming fusion enzymes. So we can kind of categorize um, our fusion enzymes into the aggregate forming fusion enzymes and the soluble fusion enzymes. And it's clearly visible that the activity of the soluble fusion enzymes is much higher and also the handling is of course a lot better. And as a conclusion, the fusion with ethyl PP3 um, showed the highest activity. So next up was to test the inactivation. And we did this um, with enzyme in reaction solution. And uh, therefore we carried out the uh, biotransformation in a steered uh, quartz glass cubette and thereby illuminated um, with blue light of 450 nanometers. So um, we tested also the uh, inactivation with all of our four fusion enzymes. But for this presentation, I, try, um, I decided to only show uh, the best inactivation, which was again achieved via the SOPP3 tech. So uh, for the activation, we used a single LED um, with an intensity of roughly 60 milliwatt per square centimeter. And you can see here in dark, um, with the dark um, points, the reaction without illumination and um, in blue, the reaction with illumination. And you can see clearly that the activity declines quite fast. And after 20 minutes of illumination, the enzyme, the fusion enzyme is basically completely inactivated. So um, the fusion with the photosynthesizer worked and we were able to inactivate our enzymes. Um, and again, SOPP3 was um, the best performing photosynthesizer, and therefore we chose to further uh, test SOPP3 with other light setups to optimize uh, the inactivation um, of the uh, carboligase and the tramitaminase as well, because right now um, we can see that we need to lie up around 20 to 30 minutes for the inactivation, which is quite long for an application of the cascade. So next up was the um, optimization of the inactivation. And therefore we just tested different setups um, from single LEDs, LED strips or panels of up to 260 LEDs. And we tested varying intensities of 0 0.1 to 60 milliwatt per square centimeters. And this was done for the carboligase as well as for the transaminase. So um, to the already mentioned carboligase, um, we choose uh, the CB2025 from Chromobacterium violaceum as amine transaminase. So at first I can show you the optimization of the carboligase inactivation. Then we did a lot of tests and various setups, but also here I will only show um, the best result with um, the most optimal setup. And this was in this case uh, a setup with two LED panels and 260 LEDs with an intensity of 0 0.5 to 3 milliwatt per square centimeter. Um, so we tested a dark condition as a control and three different light conditions. So the specialty here was that we started uh, the reaction of all four setups in the dark. And then after a reaction time of 12 minutes, we switched on the blue light and you can see uh, in comparison uh, to the dark reaction that the blue light um, directly has an impact uh, on the carboligase fusion and inactivates the enzyme. When you focus on this dot, it seems basically that the enzyme can be inactivated within two minutes. So using the SPP3 tag, we can inactivate the carboligase um, completely within two minutes of time. So when taking a look at the whole cascade, the inactivation of the carboligase now went very well, but what actually is with the transaminase? So with amine transaminase, this is a little bit of a special case because we discovered um, that when we do a negative control without any photosynthesizer tag, so only the free CB225, that upon blue light illumination, we are also able to inactivate the enzyme uh, close to completely with an illumination time of two hours. Uh, here we again used a setup with a single LED um, with an intensity of 60 milliwatt per square centimeter. And this was quite impressive. And um, we realized that this is actually mediated by PLP. So pyrex sulfate phosphate is the cofactor um, of the CV2025. And PLP can actually also act as a photosynthesizer and inactivate the CV2025 without any tag necessary. So um, this is quite interesting. So here you can see the uh, spectra of PLP um, left in the complete dark. And you can see clearly how um, the structure of PLP changes um, under blue light exposure. 
but this is not only the case for blue light illumination, also under um, lab light illumination, so like the normal lights we have uh, in the lab, the electric lights, uh, PLP changes its structure uh, quite a lot. And then we thought, okay, PLP is used uh, in a variety of enzymes, it's an important cofactor. And when uh, light is able to degrade PLP so fast uh, and blue light inactivates the enzyme so severely, um, maybe just the illumination with normal light can lead to a negative effect on the activity of PLP-dependent enzymes. And most of these enzymes are not handled under dark conditions. So does this mean when we use PLP-dependent enzymes, we have to work on the dark? To answer this question, we uh, chose four different enzymes um, besides the already presented CB2025. We used two amine transaminases, one from Bacillus megatherium and one, one from Vibrio fluvialis. And additionally, we chose a non, um, we choose a uh, non-amine transaminase of the lysine decarboxylase from E. coli. And for all of these four enzymes, we tested four, uh, three different setups. The first setup was uh, under complete dark conditions. So the expression, the purification, also the uh, activity tests were done under complete dark conditions. So the enzymes really saw not any light. Um, then the second condition was quite the opposite, um, but like the normal conditions you would uh, use for enzymes, which are expression, purification, and activity test uh, under light conditions, like normal laboratory electric light. And the third condition was a mixed condition where the expression and the purification were done um, with lights on, but the activity assay was done um, with the addition of dark um, PLP. So the results were quite interesting. Um, you can already see for the CV2025 that compared to the reaction uh, in dark, uh, the reaction in yellow with full light um, has a significant uh, decrease uh, in activity. And for the third option where dark PLP is added, the enzyme is able to recover again a little bit. In the second case uh, of the BFTA, we barely saw any influence uh, of the different illumination setups. So here it seems like um, PLP and the illumination do not have any influence on the activity of the enzyme. For the third enzyme, the BMTA, um, the results look similar to the CV2055. So also under illumination, we see uh, a significant inactivation and the enzyme is able to recover a little bit um, when we add uh, dark PLP. And uh, the last option for the ECLDC, we saw the strongest decrease in activity during illumination and also the enzyme was not able to recover uh, much when adding fresh PLP to the reaction. So um, we saw in some cases a significant inactivation of the enzymes uh, due to illumination with normal light. Um, but it seems like the inactivation depends uh, on the different enzymes. And the reasons for that could be the different PLP binding uh, mechanisms of the enzymes uh, and also reaction components which are present. So um, definitely when you're working with PLP dependent enzymes, you should consider, consider the light conditions um, you use. So finally, I want to thank Dörte and the whole biopatalysis group, as well as my cooperation and the product partners. And of course, my students who contributed uh, a lot to this work. And thank you for your attention. And again, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to present my project here. Great. Um, thank you, Tim. So we have time for a couple questions. Uh, go ahead, Anthony. Sorry, I'm just trying to catch up on the, uh, on the feed. Oh, no problem. Okay, so there are no questions at the moment. So may, maybe maybe I could go first then. So uh, very interesting that the PLP independent enzymes are deactivated by the presence of light. Do you, I guess two things, is that also oxygen dependent? Um, I guess is one question. Do you have any ideas of like, you know, what the mechanisms of deactivation are if you, do, if you can rescue activity with PLP? So um, it's not completely sure. So it seems like um, blue light mediates a uh, yeah, structural change of PLP and thereby um, amino acids um, as histidine in the active center of the enzyme are irre irreversibly destroyed. And I think it's not oxygen dependent. But we have to test that. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, so sorry, we have, a, we have a question now from uh, Lucian Wong from Manchester. So thank you. Do you know why some PLPN, so, sorry, some PLPNs are more sensitive than others? Um, and how do native organisms protect their enzymes from inactivation processes? Yeah, so um, we are not completely sure. We definitely have to investigate this uh, further. Um, but um, it's obvious that the different enzymes have the dif different ability to bind PLP. So some enzymes bind the PLP stronger and some enzymes have the ability to exchange the PLP. And maybe thereby some enzymes can exchange the degraded PLP to fresh and PLP when uh, fresh PLP and which is not degraded is provided. And thereby there can be differences um, within the um, illumination and inactivation. Okay, we have a question from Bernard Hauer. Um, nice talk. Do you see um, a possibility to, tran to transfer your results into a reactor? So I assume this is now a question regarding the cascade. Um, so this is, of course, um, one um, big point of this project to do an upscaling um, and also to design some kind of um, yeah, illuminated reactors um, where we can perform our reaction. So it is definitely the goal to do an upscaling, but in our case, this is probably like 10 to 30 milliliter upscaling. 